we're good to go, right? All right, hi everyone. Thanks for e joining us uh, for our talk about ethics of scarce resource allocation. Uh, my name is John Bergman. I'm a urologist at UCLA, uh, and I do a lot of my clinical work at the county and the VA. Our county hospital is uh, the second largest health public health system in the country, and our VA is the second busiest VA in the country. Um, I'm also the chief of bioethics at the at our VA, um, so I do a lot of our surgical ethics. Uh, and we've been pretty involved with a lot of the COVID planning and how it would work if we had uh, scarce resources. Um, our moder moderator today is the great Kelly Farrow, who hopefully you can see on your screen. Um, Kelly is one of our super duper star residents, uh, the kind that only comes around once every decade or so. Um, she's the kind of resident that if she's on your service and you're getting to work with her, you wake up every morning with a big smile on your face because uh, she's the one you're gonna spend your day with. Um, Kelly was born in San Francisco. She did her undergrad at Stanford, where uh, she was a division one rower. Uh, she then went to, uh, further south to San Diego to do her MD and her master's. Um, she does everything so perfectly and makes it seem so easy. Uh, she's also an avid runner. And we recently figured out, um, I don't know if Erin Laviana is on this call, but we recently figured out that Kelly runs marathons faster for a woman than he does for a man. Um, and he always tells everyone that he's the fastest person in any program, but uh, that should be with a caveat, um, unless Kelly Farrow's in her program. Um, so we are incredibly lucky to have Kelly at UCLA, and I feel fortunate that uh, I get to do this talk with her today. Um, of note, Kelly also recently sent you all a survey, um, a very important survey about how COVID has affected uh, your residency training. Um, so uh, let's do a quick plug to uh, please complete the survey because it'll be interesting and hopefully useful. Um, the talk today is going to be very short. It's going to be uh, definitely shorter than the hour. Um, so please, uh, I, I know it's a little hard to make it interactive in webinar form, but if you have any questions along the way or any thoughts or anything else you want us to mention, uh, please just add it to the chat along the way as we talk. Um, and Kelly will be looking through the chat and uh, Kelly, please feel free to, you know, stop me and interject and we can uh, kind of tailor this talk according to whatever is the most interesting uh, to you. Um, so thanks so much for having us. I have no relevant disclosures. Um, I wanted to just start by reviewing what the normal pillars of uh, medical bioethics are. This is different than how it is in a pandemic, but at baseline when we get an ethics consult and someone wants uh, help with a patient in the hospital, uh, they send us the case and then we analyze the case based on the five basic pillars of medical bioethics. Um, those five pillars are beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, justice, and parsimony. So beneficence just means doing good. So anything we can do in a medical sense that brings some kind of uh, benefit to a patient is part of beneficence. Non-maleficence is doing no harm uh, based on the Hippocratic Oath. Autonomy involves doing what a patient wants. And this often gets a little more complicated than just asking someone what they want. Because um, often patients uh, are incapacitated, whether it's from psychiatric disease, from dementia, from a medical thing, from surgery if they're intubated and can't talk. And we have several ways of trying to still respect their autonomy, even if we can't talk to them and ask them what their preferences are. We can rely on a surrogate decision maker, including family members, friends, previous doctors, and other people like that. We can rely on old documents like advanced directives and posts. Um, and really, the, more, the, the better job we do at baseline of having conversations with patients in clinic, usually in the outpatient setting, usually when they're healthy, that allows us to respect their autonomy when they get into you know, an ICU ventilated type situation, not only because we know what they want and that their preferences are documented, but also because they will have resolved it with the rest of their family members. So if we start these discussions early about a patient's preferences and we're able to discuss it with a patient, we're uh, able to have the patient discuss it with their family members, uh, have the family members discuss it with each other, and then codify that in something like an advanced directive or a post, that makes it that once the patient is in the ICU intubated, 
and in kind of a bad state, uh, we're uh, much better able to respect their autonomy. Justice means two things. So the, the concept of justice uh, in bioethics uh, was, uh, was first uh, described by Aristotle, and it involves treating equal people equally and unequal people unequally. So I think treating equal people equally is pretty self-explanatory, you know, treat everyone the same. The treating unequal people unequally um, is kind of, uh, uh, I think, well represented by this little uh, diagram of trying to watch a baseball game. So if we treated everyone equally and gave everyone to uh, a box to stand on, that would be less just than treating people unequally and allowing the really tall person no boxes the kind of medium person, one box, and the short person, two boxes. Um, I, as a short person, am especially uh, understanding of this, and uh, I, I think it's fair to treat unequal people unequally. The, one of the places where this comes in uh, into close view medically is with uh, patients with psychiatric disease, where if we say, look, uh, this person is in diabetic ketoacidosis, but because he or she is schizophrenic, they're trying to fight us to not let us give them care. Um, we're obligated to do everything we can to give them the care that everyone else would get because those people are unequals and it's okay to treat them unequally. Parsimony basically means don't waste any money or any other resources. Now, these five principles are very rarely all well aligned in a case that gets referred to an ethics committee because in something where everything is straightforward, where you know, doing a procedure, doing a surgery uh, is good by each of the five principles, then you just go ahead and do it and there's no ethical dilemma. The cases we get as an ethics committee is where there's some kind of tension between these five principles. If you have any questions about these five bioethical principles, please put it in the chat and uh, Kelly will stop me and we can uh, definitely clarify any of these five. The ethics of public health are a little bit different. So this is the ethics of how do we care for a population of patients rather than just the individual patient. Um, the pillars are a little bit different. And as you'll see as we go through some of our sample cases, it may actually lead to a tension where what we would do in normal situations is different than what we would do during a public health disaster. So the five basic pillars of um, how to be ethical during uh, for public health include respect, fairness, transparency, duty to care, and organizational reciprocity. Respect means we want to treat all patients kindly regardless of what we're actually eventually doing for them. So even if we're telling the patient that they don't get a vent, let's say, because of whatever our um, situation is, we still want to be kind, we still want to offer that patient palliative care, um, even if we can't let their family members see them because of COVID, we want to do everything we can to allow them to interact uh, as best we can based on their wishes. Um, and we basically just want to be kind, even if we're limited in what we're able to offer them. Um, on a more, much more simple manner, you know, if we have a patient with a kidney stone and it's not obstructive and we're delaying their surgery, um, we don't want to tell them to buzz off and, you know, we'll call you in three months and deal with it. We still want to be respectful and kind and call them and explain to them why we're putting off their surgery um, and basically just treat everyone kindly and treat them as humanely as we can. Fairness is one of the principles where public health may actually come into conflict with our basic bioethical principles because we want to be fair not only to our individual but also to our society. So we want to think of our individual patient but also about our population of patients. What that basically means is we want to maximize the benefit for the greatest number of people. You can see where that may come into tension with individual ethics because in the individual ethics, we may want to offer someone an intervention or a procedure or a ventilator where um, in a, if we want to be fair to our population, we may have to deny someone their kidney stone surgery, their partial nephrectomy, their ventilator because we're trying to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Transparency means that we want to be very clear ahead of time about why we're setting things up the way we're setting them up. So we don't want to get into a crisis situation and then say, Kelly gets a ventilator and John doesn't. What we want to say is, here's our set of rules ahead of time. 
then explain why we set up those rules, and then if, based on those rules, Kelly gets a ventilator and John doesn't, we can say, look, we discussed this ahead of time. These are the rules. You know, Kelly's a much better person than John, so she gets the vent. Um, but it's very important to be transparent about why uh, we've set things up the way we have. And this is why I know all of us are incredibly sick of getting, you know, 12,000 emails every single day from our multiple hospital systems, you know, with all these updates and updates and explanations and, you know, pathways and guidelines and whatnot. But the reason those are sent out is to maximize transparency for why the hospital or the health system is acting the way uh, that it is. Duty of care means that we all are required to try to provide our patients care, um, even at risk to ourselves. And this really has two components. The reason that even though all of us, when we come to work during COVID, have a higher risk of getting sick, getting our family members sick, getting our kids sick, getting our parents sick, the reason we still have a duty to do that based on the ethics of public health is, first of all, we have a duty to society. You know, we chose to be doctors, not some other profession. So we have a duty to try to care for our patients. Um, but we also have a duty to each other. So if there's patients with COVID who need to be cared for and one of us refuses to come to work, that means an increased workload to someone else and increased risk to someone else. So for that reason, those are the two reasons that there's a duty to care for each of us who are in the health profession. Now, obviously, there's a lot of flexibility within that. I think those of us who, you know, are younger and healthier can definitely try to step in and do more than our fair share so that people who are, you know, more elderly attendings, have higher comorbidity, pregnancy, anything like that can decrease, you know, their exposure somewhat. But as a group, we certainly have a duty to our patients and to each other. The final, the final and the fifth uh, pillar of the ethics of public health is organizational reciprocity. And that basically means that we shouldn't hoard resources, that whether it's uh, OR time or ventilators or ICU beds, we can't just think about our own set of patients or our own organization. We really have to think of the wider group of our population of patients and share those resources, whether it's, you know, uh, staff members, uh, whether it's vents, whether it's ORs, across as broad a system as possible so that we can maximize the good for the greatest number of people without discriminating. Because otherwise what happens is, uh, as we've seen with COVID, the patients who tend to be the most socio-demographically uh, disadvantaged are the ones who get the least uh, access to care. So we have an Eth uh, ethical duty to try to minimize that by sharing resources across our system. If there are any questions about either the ethics of public health or the basic bioethics principles, uh, please type that into the chat and Kelly will read it aloud and we can definitely stop the talk and discuss it a little bit. Um, it should be noted though, as we mentioned at the beginning, that there often will be a tension between the individual ethics principles and the ethics of public health. And I'm gonna go through a couple cases where hopefully we can highlight how that would look. So uh, the cases I'm, I'm about to show are actual ethics cases that got referred to the ethics committee within the last couple of weeks. Um, the first one is an 82 year old man. He lived in a nursing home. Uh, it was the VA nursing home. And there was a policy that came out that everybody in the nursing home for the good of the population had to get COVID tested. And this 82-year-old man refused. He said, I don't want to do it. I understand the risks. I understand the benefits. I don't want to get tested. He had capacity. He was clear of mind. He could explain why he wanted that decision, but he refused testing. So our first question is, under normal circumstances, you know, if we were not in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, we were trying to test someone for normal reasons, would he be allowed to refuse testing? And we'll give you guys about uh, 20 or 30 seconds to uh, answer that question. All right. 
So uh, we have our first poll results, and everyone seems to agree that under normal circumstances, he would be able to refuse testing. Now let's go to a COVID situation where now that we're in a crisis, is he allowed to refuse testing during a crisis? Yeah, so this one's much closer. So during a crisis, uh, the majority of us, but not by a lot, thinks that he, that he is allowed to refuse, uh, and 41% think that he cannot refuse. So when we look at it, uh, in the left-hand column, we have our normal bioethical principles, and in the right-hand column, we have the principles during a pandemic. Um, and I think the, the driving factor at baseline, which is our left-hand column, would be that we would want to respect his autonomy. Just like 97% of you said, um, in a normal circumstance, uh, even if a patient is making a bad medical decision, they're allowed to make their own medical decisions, and he would be allowed to refuse to do the test. The right-hand column, again, shows our uh, public health ethical principles. And I think the main one is fairness, where we're also responsible for population health and maximizing the benefit for the greatest number of people. And if our institution decided that COVID testing is necessary to protect everyone and to maximize our population health, then based on uh, the public health ethics, we would be allowed to force him to get COVID tested. And what our bioethics committee recommended was with, that we actually do uh, force him to get tested. Um, it becomes a very difficult practical matter because this is an 82-year-old man who can also physically refuse, and uh, it's not easy to perform a test on someone who doesn't want to do it. But we said that ethically, um, uh, we should force him to get COVID tested. If there's any questions about that, put it in the chat box, and we'll try to um, address it as we go along. Um, our next poll question is uh, another real ethics case that we got, again, in the last couple weeks. It was a 58-year-old woman. Uh, she was pre-op, and she refused a mask, and she refused testing. By that point at our VA, we had uh, set up a policy where everyone who's going to get surgery has to wear a mask to be in the hospital, and they have to get COVID tested uh, before they can get surgery. Uh, now, this was an elective surgery. It was urgent, but not emergent. So under normal circumstances, would she be, would she be uh, allowed to refuse a preoperative test, yes or no? So most people think that she would be able normally to refuse a pre-op test. And again, this goes back to even if a patient is making a bad medical decision, um, they're allowed to make the medical decision for themselves as long as they have capacity. Now, the corollary question, again, during a crisis kind of situation like during COVID, would she be allowed to refuse testing during that time? Yes or no? So most people think that she cannot refuse it uh, during a crisis. And that's what we thought as well uh, in our ethics committee. So again, left-hand column is steady state, right-hand column is what happens during a pandemic. And during steady state, we would basically want to respect her autonomy, where if she doesn't, if she's making a bad medical decision by refusing a pre-op test, and that's a risk to her, she's allowed to do it. But during a pandemic where we have to think of the ethics of public health, 
if we want to be fair to everyone and keep everyone as safe as possible, then she could not refuse her mask and she could not refuse the pre-op COVID test. Um, and that's the recommendation we gave. We said, uh, because we're in a pandemic, if she refuses her mask or she refuses her pre-op COVID test, she should not be offered surgery. Now, switching gears a little bit to how we decide, you know, how do we decide that we're going from the left-hand column to the right-hand column? How do we decide that, you know, we're at steady state where we get to think of normal bioethical principles or when we're in a crisis state where we get to think of public health principles? Um, and that basically uh, depends on our overall capacity. So um, conventional capacity is basically when we're, what we're normally at. We have our normal amount of resources, we have to care for our population of, re of patients with our resources. Contingency capacity is when we have fewer resources, but we're still able to offer pretty much the same uh, number of uh, procedures and the same amount of medical care. So even if we have fewer ORs, less staff, we're still able to run things the way we normally run things. Crisis capacity is when we totally shift into something else. Uh, crisis capacity is when we decide we are no longer able to provide our normal standard of care and we're now allowed ethically to offer a different standard of care. So that comes into play for a urologist two ways. One is if we're talking about during a crisis, you know, managing our patients who need acute resources like ventilators or ICUs and how do we manage those patients. Um, but it also... Uh, it also refers to how we manage our aura schedule. We can normally say that uh, standard of care is to offer someone with a four centimeter renal mass a robotic partial nephrectomy within three or four or five weeks. And ethically, why is it okay to suddenly say that we're putting off that procedure? Ethically, we can say we're changing our standard of care because we're no longer in conventional capacity, we're no longer in contingency capacity, we're now in crisis capacity, and because we're in a crisis, we're now changing our standard of care. And if we ever got sued or questioned about why normal standard of care is to do a PCNL or partial nephrectomy or a robotic prostatectomy within four, six, eight weeks, why are we now changing our standard of care? We could ethically point to the fact that we're now in crisis capacity, and therefore the standards are different. Once we enter, enter crisis, then we activate two things. We activate, activate the, the scarce resource allocation team and the triage team. What the scarce resource allocation team is, it's the team that advises the facility about how to manage the crisis. So that team, which is called the SRA team, works with the incident command structure, which is that team that meets every morning and every afternoon to kind of go over how the hospital is doing with their equipment, with their supplies, with their patients, um, you know, are we uh, surging, are we not surging? Um, they assist the shift to crisis care, so they're not the ones who decide when we're in crisis capacity, but they recommend to the hospital when it's time to go into crisis capacity, and then the hospital can decide that. Um, the SRA team oversees the operations when there's scarce resources, and they implement triage. The triage team is different. So the scarce resource allocation team is responsible for advising the facility and the triage team is in charge of the patient. The triage team functions under the scarce resource allocation team. They assess uh, individual patients, they gather the triage scores, and then they report to the scarce resource allocation team. The membership should be pretty different between the SRA team and the triage team. Ideally, you want them to be totally different so that the triage team can focus only on the patient and advise the SRA team about what is best for the patient. And then the SRA team can advise the facility about what to do. So the scarce resource allocation team should have a team leader, someone from logistics or management, someone from clinical care, representation from nursing, someone from the ER, representation from ethics, and then uh, optional representation from palliative care, social work, the chaplain, and ideally a patient representative as well. 
Now, if you don't have a massive team, it is okay for uh, one person to fill multiple roles. So for instance, in our institution, I'm the SRA team representative for ethics and for surgery, but you don't want that person to also be on the triage team. So the triage team will also have a team leader, someone from logistics and management, someone from clinical care, and anyone else uh, that we think would be relevant. So even though someone like me can be the ethics person for the ethics person and the surgery person for the SRA team, there should be no overlap if possible between the triage team and the SRA team. And the reason is you want the triage team to really think about what is best for the patient, assess the patient and uh, report that to, to the SRA team, and then you want the SRA team to take all that data and advise the facility. If there's any questions about that, put it in the chat uh, and we can address it. When we go into our triage protocols, it's very different from how we normally triage patients. If you think about, you know, a sick patient showing up to the ER and, you know, the triage uh, nurse or the triage doctor looking at that patient and assessing them, they usually think of who is the sickest and let's get the sickest person who's going to die the soonest uh, care before someone who's less sick. When you're doing tertiary triage, like in a COVID crisis, you actually look at the opposite of that. You look at survivability. So how likely is this person to get discharged and to have some type of quality of life at discharge? When we look at the tiebreakers between people who are close, they have to be just, they have to be fair, and they have to be identified ahead of time. So one of the questions that comes up a lot during the COVID time is people like us, healthcare workers. Um, should we get priority ahead of other people for scarce resources like medications, like remdesivir, uh, like a ventilator, like ICU care, should we get priority over everyone else? So about 72% 70, of people think that we should get priority over everyone else. 28% think that uh, we should not. Um, and there's no right answer. Um, this is a, a hot topic in the ethics community, uh, especially during COVID time. The main argument in favor of healthcare workers getting priority access is um, first, that we're choosing to put ourselves in harm's way in order to provide care. The argument against that ethically is that as healthcare workers, we signed up for this. You know, we agreed to be doctors or nurses, uh, people who we know are putting ourselves at higher risk as people who are doing other types of jobs, and that that's the risk we assumed as part of our profession. And then the other ethical argument in favor of our getting priority over other people is that we can actually continue to provide care. So if we don't have enough healthcare workers and one of us gets sick, if we are able to make that person get healthy again, that person can go back in the workforce and maximize the health for our population. So there's no correct answer. It's a hotly debated topic in ethics, um, but those are the two main arguments that get made um, for, for and against why healthcare workers should get priority access. The triage tool we use uh, to figure out how to um, divvy up scarce resources. So in this, just as an example, let's think of ventilators because that's what we've all been thinking about during coronavirus. Um, when, we're in, when we're trying to do triage because we're in a crisis mode, we start by doing an initial assessment of all our patients. And we assign everyone a SOFA score. A SOFA score is basically a sequential organ failure assessment where the higher you are, the higher likelihood you have of developing um, organ failure, the higher your SOFA score. So think of a high SOFA score as someone who is unhealthy and a low SOFA score as someone who's very healthy. So uh, the blue in the initial assessment, the people who are blue are the people who have a high SOFA score. The people who are red are the people who have a low SOFA score. 
the people who are yellow are the people who have an in-between SOFA score, and the people who are green have such a low SOFA score that they don't even need a ventilator. So our question now is a little more complicated than our yes, no questions from before. Who should get the highest priority for scarce resources, resource if we don't have enough for everyone? So if we have a limited number of ventilators and we have to choose between the blue people, the red people, and the yellow people, again, the blue people are the sickest people, the red people are the healthiest people, and the yellow people are kind of in between. Who should have the highest priority for a scarce resource? red, blue, or yellow. We'll give you a little bit more time to think about this, so let's give everyone maybe about 40, 45 seconds to answer this question. So we have uh, the biggest, about 52% of people think that the intermediate should get the highest priority, uh, followed by red, and 15% think that the bluest people should get the highest priority. And the way this is decided is like this, where if we don't have enough ventilators for everyone or any other resources, I'm gonna talk about ventilators just because that's kind of what's in our zeitgeist, but any resources that any resource that we don't have enough of. Um, the people who are the sickest, those people get excluded because they're the least likely to actually make it out of the hospital healthy with some kind of quality of life. The green people get cut out of the discussion because they don't need events, so we can ignore them from now. And then the real decision is between the red people and the yellow people. So red is healthier and yellow is less healthy. And between those two groups, the red people actually get higher priority than the yellow people. The reason is, if we have to pick between the two, the red people are more likely to survive and to exit the hospital with some kind of quality of life. So hopefully we don't have to pick between them, but if we do, we're going to give the ventilator to the red person before we give it to the yellow person. Another thing that comes up is within each category, how are we going to decide who to give the resource to if two people have the same score? So let's say Kelly and I both have a SOFA score of 10. How are we going to decide who gets the ventilator? And we choose based on the trajectory of disease. So if someone is at a 10 but is getting healthier, whereas someone else is at a 10 but getting sicker, we give the vent to the person who's getting healthier. So if Kelly used to be a SOFA 12 and now she's a 10, and I used to be a SOFA 5 and now I'm a 10, because I'm going in the wrong direction and Kelly's going in the right direction, Kelly gets the vent and I don't. One point to make about the blue category, um, why it's important to be able to um, explain why we're taking someone off a ventilator in a crisis situation, is this is really important in order to ethically explain why we're taking someone off a ventilator, even if that's not their stated uh, desire or if they're not what their family wants or what their advanced directive says. We often get into situations in our ethics committee where someone is on a ventilator and even if we think that ethically they should, uh, we should be able to withdraw care, whether it's because what the patient wants or what the family says the patient would want or any other reason, it's almost 100% of the time that even if we say that ethically that person should be allowed to be taken off the ventilator based on you know the legal team and the administrative team that patient is basically never coming off the vent and what this triage tool allows us to do it actually empowers us to take people who are in, in this blue category who are very unlikely to survive and actually get them off the vent so this is the little tool that gets put on all the you know icu units where everybody in the unit can help prioritize their patient. And the triage team walks around with these little cards that tells them what to do for blue, red, yellow, and green. So you get put, put into these categories based on your SOFA score. The blue people get excluded. The red people have the highest priority. The yellow people get intermediate priority. And the green people aren't really uh, 
in the discussion yet because they don't need the scarce resource. So we would do an initial assessment. So if we're talking about ventilators and ICU, as soon as crisis care gets uh, uh, decided upon and activated, you then look at all the patients who are on a vent and you, you give them a SOFA score and based on that SOFA score, they become either blue, red, or yellow. The blue people get triage to palliative care. The red people stay on a vent and the yellow people stay on a vent only until the next assessment. When you're doing the next assessment, you're then looking not only at the people who are on a vent, but everyone else who's going to be in need of events. So again, everyone who's in blue is going to go to palliative care. The red people are going to get the highest priority to be put on events. And the yellow people get events only if there's not a red person who needs the event. So let's go, uh, actually walk through a little bit of how that would work um, in a crisis situation. So let's say today is Friday. We start to get a surge. Um, we enter crisis care. And therefore, on Friday afternoon, we do an initial assessment of everybody who's in our ICU. So let's start in the left-hand column, because the left-hand column here is all the people who are currently on a vent or in the ICU. And this column here, the right-hand column, is the people who may need a vent. So we're currently at a state where we have two vacant beds, two people who are blue, meaning they have a high SOFA score and are unlikely to survive, Six people who are red, which means they have a low SOFA score and are the most likely to survive, and two people who are yellow, which means they're kind of in between. So when we do our initial assessment, we see that we have uh, 12 current beds, but we have nine people awaiting a bed. So what we would do is we would, uh, obviously we don't want any vacant ICUs or uh, vacant vents because that's a waste. The people who are blue in both categories get transferred to palliative care. All of the people who are red from the right-hand category, from the people who are in need, would get transferred onto a vent. And then we would need to, as an institution, decide what is the time point when we would take these two people in the yellow column who are currently on a vent, when are we going to transfer them off of a vent and put these two red people on? Most organizations use 48 hours as the standard. So these two yellow people get to keep their vent for 48 hours. Um, I personally feel that this should be an ongoing process. So these two red people should get preference over these two yellow people. And I don't think we should wait the 48 hours, but most organizations use 48 hours as their time point. All right. So now we're at the 48 hour, 48 hour reassessment. We take these two yellow people, we make them blue. That frees up two beds. So we can take these two red people and transfer them onto the vent. That's all well and good, but we're now at capacity for our vent. Let's say at this four hour, 48 hour reassessment, we now have filled up our vent. We have 12 people who are red and three people who are yellow. We can fill up, uh, we can transfer everyone to the left-hand column. So we obviously don't want the vent going unused. So we had these two blue people. We transferred them to palliative care. We took the two red people from the right-hand column here and put them in the left-hand column here. But now we still have 13 people waiting for a vent. So this is what basically happens when you've surged beyond your hospital's capacity. And this is where we're no longer able to provide uh, care even to our people who are in the red hand category. And as an institution, we want to do everything we can to avoid this situation. So ideally, this can all be an academic exercise, um, but this is how we would think about sharing uh, scarce resources uh, during a pandemic. Thank you so much for your uh, attention and uh, I think we now can uh, do the Q&A and answer any other questions you have. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Bergman. Um, so we've had some questions from the chat and the Q&A come in as you went through. I'll go ahead and start kind of more at the beginning. You discussed the principle of organizational reciprocity and dispersion uh -huh. of resources like PPE and ventilators between hospital uh -huh. systems. 
Um, so you already highlighted the moral imperative that resource rich centers donate to the resource poor. Yeah. Some follow up questions in that regard is uh, one participant asked, it seems that organizational reciprocity and fairness might be a bit conflicting, especially when it comes to minorities or disadvantaged populations. How can those principles be balanced? I don't think they've been balanced particularly well during uh, this crisis. I think within health systems, uh, people have done fairly well. So if you look at the New York County system or the LA County system, patients get transferred from one hospital to another, you know, resources get transferred from one person, one place to another, surgeries get transferred from one person, uh, facility to another, PPE gets transferred. But across institutions and across health systems, I don't think we've done a very good job of that. Um, I've been very bothered when I've seen reports of, you know, someone do donates 10,000 masks to UCLA and UCLA keeps that for the UCLA health system and doesn't share it with a broader population. Now, it might be that practically, you know, we don't want to share everything with the, the entire world or the entire nation just in terms of shipping and logistics, but Ethically, it does not pass the ethical test to say that uh, masks are donated only to UCLA and will be only used in the UCLA system if someone in the county system needs them more. Likewise, if New York needs more PPE than California or Idaho or Wyoming, um, it is ethically unfair for those systems to not share their uh, not just, not just their products with someone like New York, but also their staff. So if there's, you know, VA or county staff from a place where they're not needed, um, ethically they should go, or they should be in play to go to New York and help out if there's a lack of staff, a lack of resources. Um, does that answer the question or was there another aspect of it that uh, I didn't address? No, I mean, from my read, I think that that's very helpful. I think there are a lot of administrative parts of actually enacting these principles that, that you just addressed. Um, there are also a pretty good number of questions regarding the scenarios that you had about, for example, preoperative testing, um, the ones that your ethics committee addressed in the VA population. Um, so there's a question, kind of like a pragmatic question. If the elderly gentleman in situation one physically refuses, can he be denied, yeah. you know, services that he otherwise would be allowed if he did comply? Um, and a kind of separate but related question is there, if you're not talking about operating on him, but rather just housing him in a, like a nursing facility, right. Do you need to offer him isolation instead of forced yeah. testing? That is the really complicated part and where it becomes not just an, uh, an issue of providing care, but also providing housing where you live, it adds a whole new layer of complexity. The good thing is we're very used to this complexity because at both VA and county, we do a lot of the housing for our patient population. So we've had a lot of experience in our normal ethics committee of how to manage tricky situations that also involve housing. As far as uh, not providing someone care, um, it seems pretty awful that if someone needs a cystectomy, let's say, and they're gonna die without their cystectomy and they'll be cured with their cystectomy, that just because they refuse to wear a mask or refuse to get COVID tested, we won't give them their cystectomy. But ethically, it actually is fair because if there's such a high risk that that person is suddenly gonna infect the anesthesiologist and the surgeon and all the other patients in pre-op, um, ethically it's okay to let that person with bladder cancer die so that you don't infect everyone else and have a lot more people die. Now, the reality is before we say, yes, let's just deny them their cystectomy, there's 10 different steps that we do to say, let's try to convince them, let's involve the son and get the son to try to convince them, let's try to, uh, you know, basically juggle 18 different things to try to get them to where we want them to be. We don't just say sign off, no cystectomy, go die. So um, we do try to massage it the most we can. When it comes to the housing, the same thing. You know, we wouldn't just say we're going to tie this guy down, you know, shove a needle in him, give him some benzodiazepines and test him. We would try to isolate him at first, 
um, and kind of try to get around, you know, the yes or no question the most we can. But at the end of the day, if it comes down to really him refusing a test, despite everything we're trying, and if we feel that quarantine is still putting the staff at risk that has to come in and care for him, it is acceptable to sedate someone and forcibly test them in a public health emergency. Perfect. Um, I mean, not perfect to forcibly sedate someone. <laughs> None of this is perfect. A very, a very excellent answer. Um, <laughs> there are a few questions coming in as well about triage, about your triage scenarios. Um, one that I think you can probably answer pretty quickly is how far has our institution gotten towards any of the, you know, ventilator triage scenarios? So the good thing is we haven't got, we haven't had to use any of them, but we've set up all the systems. So we've set up the scarce resource allocation team and we've set up the triage team. And then we've gone through multiple simulations. So we take actual patients from the ER we input all of their information, all of their labs and, you know, physical exam and the other information into the little protocols to get their SOFA score. And we then go through different simulations of how would we choose patient John versus patient Kelly, just so that we, the, both the scarce resource allocation team and the triage team kind of uh, have practice doing fake patients before we have to use it on real patients. Um, we have not had to do it in our LA County system, nor at the VA, but in New York, they have had to, to activate those teams because they actually do have a lack of resources. So then piggybacking off of that, um, there were a few follow-up questions. For example, in, when you're doing that sort of allocation, say that two people had the same score at the time of presentation, they just yeah. showed up, you know, 12 hours ago, there's no real sense of trajectory. What are your kind of right. next algorithmic tools that you use to allocate? So it's very difficult and uh, every institution is different in how they decided this. The reality is if you set up enough rules ahead of time, um, it's unlikely that someone's gonna have the exact same SOFA score and be in the exact same category and not have a trajectory. So hopefully we've set up the SOFA scores and the trajectories finely enough that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like doing enough decimal points. It's unlikely to be that you and I are exactly the same to the exact same decimal point. Um, if it comes to that and our survivability is the same based on, you know, age, comorbidity, overall health, everything else like that, most organizations do first come, first serve. Um, that's very problematic, though, ethically, because we know that um, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations are going to seek care later than someone who is not socioeconomically disadvantaged. So if you have two people who are exactly, 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 exactly the same, and you do first come, first serve, you're probably going to benefit, you know, better off people. Um, and that's going to, again, lead to more discrimination in healthcare. Um, so that's what most people go like, but it's definitely, go by, but it's definitely problematic. And that's a good segue to this follow-up question, kind of in the same regard, you know, compared to Caucasian patients, certain minority patients are going to perhaps have, say, more pre-existing comorbidities or, you know, are, there, are you worried about any sort of built-in bias in these scoring assessment tools that is going to ultimately lead to unfair allocation? The answer is yes. There is a massive bias. Um, you try to set up the scarce, the, the SOFA scores and how you would manage the SOFA scores to minimize bias. So you can imagine a situation where if we didn't have all these many sets of rules and documents ahead of time, you know, if Barack Obama shows up in the ER and an undocumented worker shows up in the ER, that, you know, Barack Obama is going to get preferential treatment over the other person, where if you do at least set up all of those scores and, you know, the SOFA score is made up of lab values and very concrete things that are hard to massage, that you actually could allow someone who's more disadvantaged to get the resource ahead of someone who is disadvantaged. 
as far as kind of unspooling all of the baked in problems that make someone higher risk, that make them more likely to have more comorbidity, um, more likely to be a smoker and have heart disease and have kidney failure. That's not something that we try to unspool at that moment in the ER during a COVID crisis when both people show up, you know, in need of a vent. Um, it's definitely a problem because it definitely um, aggravates the disparities. Um, and that's why I think we have to work in parallel, you know, at the same time that we're setting up some kind of system, trying to make it as unbiased as possible, we still are obligated to try to um, manage disparities the best we can. And one example of that is homelessness has become massively rampant during COVID. And both county in Los Angeles and county in New York have been very, very aggressive about trying to go out and meet those patients where they are, they are not only find them temporary housing, but also assess them and bring them into the ER earlier than they would otherwise come so that maybe they do show up in the ER earlier than they would without these extra interventions. Maybe they have a better SOFA score and they don't get that extra hit of showing up late to get their health care. Yeah, they're all like really tough, you know, long-term yeah. problems that we're just seeing exacerbated by the acuity of this situation. Absolutely. Um, this is kind of a question about, you know, moving forward because you discussed the different stages of capacity, but kind of at what uh -huh. point on an institution level do you start talking about doing scheduled surgeries again or kind uh -huh. of resuming your standard operating practices and what concerns are there regarding kind of the double whammy of now you're taking care of non-COVID patients, but you may see another spike in COVID patients, just kind of what your thoughts are on the thoughtful way of doing that. That is incredibly tough. And I think you hit, you hit the nail on the head with the word thoughtful. Um, we have to be as thoughtful as we can about balancing the risk. Um, obviously, it's pretty easy to shut anything down for a week or two. Um, and we saw that at the time, you know, when New York was getting overwhelmed um, and we were all scared that that was going to happen everywhere in the country it's pretty easy to say nothing other than emergency surgeries for two weeks. The problem is now we're at a point where it's going to be months or many months or a year or several years. And how do we balance that risk? Um, Cause it's never going to be a clean answer of uh, we're 100% done with COVID and we can 100% go back to normal. Um, the part of our thought process at both County and VA has been, you know, given that we have limited resources, limited ICU beds, limited ERs, not only how likely is a patient to die of her disease, but how likely are they to end up in the ER and in the ICU? Um, because at some point we have to start thinking about not just doing TRBTs and cystectomies where the disease is going to kill someone pretty quickly, but also doing things like, you know, stone surgeries for stones where you have nephrostomy tubes in, stents in, um, where we have to think about the patient's going to get a UTI and sepsis and they're going to show up in the ER while all the COVID patients are in the ER. They're going to end up in the ICU when we have minimal ICU capacity. Um, we've bought ourselves, I think, enough time where we now, um, at least in LA County, are not overwhelmed with a surge of COVID patients. Um, I think ethically this goes to where we really need to use our voices as healthcare workers to advocate for maximizing how long we do social distancing for, because our ability to do things like, you know, prostatectomies, cystectomies, stone surgery, and everything else is going to be very much tied to not just how is the rest of the hospital functioning, but how much is the rest of society stopping things like social distancing, which then overwhelms our hospitals and brings us into a crisis mode where we can't run our ORs at all. I don't know if that answered the question or not. No, I think it, I mean, I think it began to answer like an unanswerable question. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. and I think, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on testing, because I know even within our mm -hmm. own, you know, the institutions that we work at as providers here in LA County, the accessibility of testing is quite variable, um, you know, yeah. from one to another. So 
I don't know how you think that might play a role in particularly talking about pre-op testing and in, in our elective Absolutely. scheduled surgery patients. I think it's a massive game changer on multiple levels. First of all, we burn through a lot less PPE because we know that if someone gets tested ahead of time, especially as our testing gets better and better and better, we don't all have to wear, you know, nine layers of PPE for every case. We can do things faster because we don't have to, you know, step out of the OR for 20 minutes and do all that other stuff that we do if we're more fearful, fearful that someone is a person under investigation. Um, so the more testing we have, we'll certainly get a lot more efficient. And then, you know, we can do more cases in a day and that's going to help the whole system overall because not only do we do more cases and fix more people's problems, that's a smaller pool of people who's at risk of showing up in the ER and the ICU, you know, with sepsis and whatnot that could have been prevented. All right, so I think we're running up on the end of our scheduled hour. I have, I think we addressed the vast majority of the questions in the q and I'll go ahead and share this with him so he can, you know, write up any answers to questions we didn't address, and I think it will get posted online with the recording and the slides for future reference. So thanks so much for your time. I love this talk. I think it's, they're like important principles in general, but especially pertinent now. So it's much appreciated. Thank you so much for everyone for joining and uh, thank you, Michelle, for all your help uh, and especially Kelly for the awesome moderating and uh, for doing this talk together. Um, I always tell my family that any thing I get to do with you, whether it's a day in clinic or a day in the OR or something like this, uh, is always something that's going to be awesome to do. So thank you for doing this together. And everyone listening, please do Kelly's survey. Uh, it's going to be super interesting. And we will uh, share the results with you as soon as we get it. Thanks so much, everyone.